Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Kyle. I am Adam Gromus. I lead on sustainability policy at Uber. And over my 20-year career in clean tech and mobility, I've had a great affection and uh, a lot of respect for the clean tech innovation that comes out of Canada, especially here in Toronto. It, about five years ago, I had the great chance of presenting to the Electric Mobility Canada General Conference in Quebec City uh, at the invitation of the late, great Catherine Cargis, who, if you don't know her, uh, the EV movement in Canada owes a great debt of gratitude to. Uh, and then about 20 years ago, I used to work in the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle space and had uh, the great benefit of going up to Vancouver all the time to visit the folks at Ballard Power. I met a lot of folks from Mississauga and innovators here in Toronto. So I have a great deal of respect for the clean tech innovation that comes right out of Canada. I'm going to kick us off uh, with a video because it, who doesn't say it better than me but the drivers on our platform. So hopefully this works. Bear with us. When did I switch to EV? Um, today. <laughs> for me, driving an electric vehicle was really a dream come true. Main reason for switching was that I felt that's the future. I love how quiet the car is. Bonjour. Hello. 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 I did not know I will ever drive one. And it happened the possibility for drivers on Uber to rent a car. Every day I see the gas prices. It's a hectic situation. I notice a lot more EVs on the road. Zero emissions is good for everybody. We all have to care about the environment. Sometimes they said, whatever you do is not going to make a difference. Yes, I think it makes a difference. At least little by little. It's like, I feel like I'm doing my part and then setting an example for everybody. Really, electric is the way to go. Thanks indeed to the EV drivers on Uber. This video is about a year old, and I'll be pleased to share with you figures in a moment that show that number has doubled in the last year. Uh, so we'll go over that in a moment. I'm going to share a few things about uh, the challenge that we all face, the solution that we think we can help with at Uber in this race towards a decarbonized and electrified transport sector, uh, talk a little bit about the results that we've seen, how we're approaching the problem, and I'd love to leave some, some time at the end for questions where there's Mike's up here uh, that you're very welcome to queue at and, and throw out some questions at the end. Sound good? OK. Sound is coming through OK? All right. All I can hear is the cacophony of conversations coming out from the, from the floor. I hope that none of this will come at a surprise to anyone in this room. And hopefully, this is the 20th time today you've seen a slide like this. Uh, but climate change is certainly real. The impacts uh, have been very difficult to anticipate because they keep getting worse. But if you look at the last 40 years of measurement of emissions, it's all going the wrong way for transportation. And transportation is a big contributor to the problem globally. About a quarter of all energy-related emissions, as you probably know, as you hopefully know. And it's usually the number one or number two contributor, depending on where you live. If we're going to reverse this, it has to go basically triple the other direction, right? To make up for the deficit, then add it two times more into the, the positive meaning reduced emissions. So we have work ahead of us. In Canada, as you all know, it is the number two contributing sector to the Canadian emissions footprint. And so transport and the electrification of transport cannot be understated how important that is. The other thing is that this isn't just about uh, a policy matter. It's not just about human health, which is big enough. This is also about a business opportunity. This is also about what consumers expect of companies like us, of their governments, of their utilities. And it's not just all consumers, especially younger consumers, are demanding more and more for sustainable products, sustainable brands, and sustainable commitments, and making good on those commitments. Uber, we're an app company. We make an app. If you're familiar, has anyone used a ride hail app before? 
some familiarity, thank you, I'm glad to hear that. I won't explain what the app looks like, but these days Uber interacts with nearly seven million drivers and couriers all over the world, in about 70 countries around the world, and there's about 150 million users in the app on the ride or the eater side of the equation. And so the question for us was, how can we help the electrification uh, movement, and what can the electrification movement mean for Uber? That was the question I was asking myself when I joined the company seven years ago as the first full-time sustainability hire. These days we have a product suite that isn't just on four wheels, it's on 18 wheel, wheels as my colleague Jin Mei presented earlier today with Uber Freight. It's down to two wheels on micromobility and even three wheels in places uh, like South Asia or Africa uh, where we have a number of different services. Uh, but more and more we're adding sustainability products that I'll go through in a moment. A couple of years ago, we convinced management that we should take this global apparatus that connects people in cars and different vehicles all over the world to say, what would it look like to make each one of those rides clean? What would it look like to have conversations going on all over the world about what the power of electric mobility is? We have a digital mobility marketplace. Let's plug it into a digital, naturally digital fuel that is electricity. So we made the commitment that by 2030, 100% of rides served by Uber would be on micromobility in public transportation or in zero emission vehicles, generally battery EVs, in 2030 in the US, Canada, in Europe, by 2040 everywhere we operate. We've since also added our delivery platform, which got real big during COVID, to that commitment set. Uh, so not only are we ambitious to reduce the waste from that eats order that you might pick up when you order food, uh, but also to help the couriers on that network electrify over time. What do the results look like? I'm gonna focus on the passenger side of our business. Last quarter, first quarter of this year, 143,000 all electric vehicle drivers around the world did more than 66 million trips. It's about eight trips a second or about, five, uh, about 500 trips a minute. So since I started talking, call it 10 minutes, we've had 50,000 or so trips in zero emission vehicles on Uber in real time in the world. 50,000 conversations between the driver and the rider. 50,000 curiosities of a customer wondering, is this an EV? Why is it so quiet? There's no roof in this Tesla. We're really proud of these figures, but we have a long way to go to reach our commitments. In the US and Canada, about, uh, call it one in every 13 miles is in an EV uh, today. One in every 12 miles or so is in an EV today. That's really outstanding. It's a long way to 100%, but if you compare it to real penetration on the road of EVs, so if you compare it, say, to registrations, that's five, six times above what the general population is doing from drivers on Uber. We're really proud of that figure, and we're asking what is it going to take to get to that next 10, 20, 30%. These are not early adopters anymore. This is the early majority. This is a tougher set of people to convince, and we have to work hard to make sure the value proposition is there. If you do the math, that's about 170 all-electric trips per driver per month on average. That's 170 transactions where the driver is earning a living on that EV. That's 170 transactions that are powered by locally generated electrons that can only be locally generated. Uh, and what it means at the driver level and from an emissions and policy perspective is because of utilization, because of the mileage that shared use drivers, taxi drivers and others do, it's four times the emission savings when you can help an Uber driver get into an EV versus a member of the general public. So from an overall spending efficiency perspective, if you're a government person, this is the opportunity to support this group of people in the early stages of this transition because of the bang for your buck it can mean on an emissions basis. I'm also really proud to say that drivers in EVs on Uber don't always look like, I mean that literally look like drivers in the general EV population. We have to do more as an industry because, generally speaking, the data would show EVs have gone mostly to white, wealthy communities, white, wealthy households. More and more of what we're finding, in fact, we did one analysis in California that showed that drivers on Uber were two to three times more likely to represent 
uh, uh, lower income household or community of color than EV drivers in the general population. We're really proud of that. We want to find ways to increase those figures because this is the challenge ahead of us as we think about helping everyone in EV uh, everyone in a vehicle get an EV tomorrow. These are real figures. If you look on the left, those are EV registrations in the general population in, this is Los Angeles, so you see EVs in Malibu, you see EVs in north of Los Angeles, Hollywood area, you don't see EVs in central LA, south central LA. On Uber, we find that ge geography has not been a factor. It's not a predictor of who is ready and willing to get into an EV. And we're so excited about that because through business innovation, through working with our partners, we can find lower price points and opportunities for drivers to get into EVs who have not been in EVs before. That means communities can see EVs who haven't seen EVs before. The way we've thought about this problem is based on our stakeholders. Drivers on one side of the marketplace, riders on the other. And I'm a policy guy, so I think a lot about the public, of course, and the policy sphere, because as you all know, policy is still such a critical factor in this industry, especially as it leaves its nascency and enters that early majority stage. Let's go through each of these and look at what we're doing. When we ask drivers, we ask them annually, we do surveys of uh, about 14,000 drivers around the world to ask them about their attitudes and interests in EVs. We ask non-EV non drivers and EV drivers. These data at the bottom are Canada specific. So this is just from the thousands of drivers we surveyed in Canada. Uh, but drivers want EVs. On Uber, they want EVs. When we ask them, what are you thinking about for your next car? More than half say, I'm interested in an EV. Uh, and most say the reason why they're interested is lower cost, of course. If I can pay less on electricity and maintenance per mile than I pay in that uh, ICE vehicle that I've been driving, I, I'm done. I'm sold. Show, show me where the car is. Now, of course, there's barriers. The number one barrier is still cost. Not just the all-in cost, but the upfront cost. The, annual, the, the monthly cash flow cost that an EV can still represent. About half of drivers say that that's a barrier to go to the EV tomorrow. Charging is also an issue. And charging for a driver on Uber, similar to a driver in, say, a taxi fleet or another commercial fleet, is a little bit different than charging for any of the rest of us that might use an EV for commuting. When you're worried about running out of charge with a paying customer in the back seat, that range anxiety doubles, triples, because you're thinking, I'm going to be stuck with this person while I look for charging, while I plug into charging. So range anxiety is very real for drivers on Uber. This particular figure focuses on uh, a population that's overrepresented on our platform, which are those without access to home charging, or those who worry that they won't have access to home charging. Drivers uh, on Uber who are in, say, a renter situation, a multifamily situation, or don't have access to off-street parking, could be in a third to uh, uh, about 40% of drivers. Uh, in this particular case, 60% say, in Canada, say, I probably couldn't have home charging access. That's a real issue for all of us to work on, because only with home charging can you realize that sweet, sweet, low electricity rates that then give you the, uh, the better value for the EV versus the ICE that you were in. To tackle these, we pledged 800 million to help drivers around the world shift to EVs, and we've broken it up to a few different programs. Education, incentives direct from Uber, discounts through partnerships, and of course, charging, which like I said, is the number two barrier for drivers on our platform. Digitally, Uber has a few surfaces, so we try to push through those surfaces, education about EVs, opportunities to connect with other drivers who are already in EVs. We call that our EV ambassador program. But it's hard to find a better substitute than a classic ride and drive. And so more and more, we have worked with those who put on ride and drive events, like in fact, Plug and Drive, who's running today's ride and drive, and they do a fantastic job at it. Uh, we've been so proud to partner with Plug and Drive over the years. Uh, more than 900 drivers have actually driven a test drive uh, with these events. We've conducted 15 uh, online webinars, and we find that this is just so critical to reach out to drivers, to give them that real EV experience, because there's just no substitute for it, particularly for those who haven't seen the EV in their neighborhood. Uh, and those types of drivers are overrepresented on our platform. Money talks, and it has to be on the table if we're going to help drivers shift 
earlier and faster than the general public, which we do to meet our goals. So Uber has put money out there in a number of forms in Canada. Drivers can earn up to $5,000 over a year period to make a shift into an EV. This incentive is live now in Canada. Uh, it's countrywide uh, through next year. We also offer discounts through partners. In, in this case, we have an Uber Pro card in which drivers can realize discounts on charging. So we want to find ways that we can bring our size and scale to those partnerships to find better offers for drivers. We're building tech. Uber's app, if you're familiar with using the Uber app as a rider, we have a separate app for drivers which helps drivers connect with those paying customers and connect with, say, gas stations traditionally, but now we're integrating EV charging. And last year, we announced a suite of new products that will help bring the electron closer to the driver. What we want to do is help drivers find cheap electrons and arbitrage those into expensive miles. That's how we create the value proposition for the EV driver on our platform. So we've put out, uh, we announced publicly last year that we're developing a suite of smart charging initi initiatives where we, if the driver consents, we can look at their battery state of charge, we can fit the next couple of trips into that battery state of charge down to a level that they tell us is their comfortable level for state of charge, we can queue them and route them to the next available charger, surface real-time pricing of those chargers, and over time help drivers have seamless payment interactions with those charging networks. This is just the beginning. This is where we're going. Um, today, what drivers will find in both Canada, the US, and across Europe is charging in their driver app. We cannot do this alone. We make an app. We have to work with the hardware providers, the software providers that have been in this industry a lot longer. And we work with a number of supply solutions and charging solution providers around the world. In Canada, I want to highlight a few of the fantastic partners that we've had, uh, particularly on the vehicle side, which is so critical to, so that we can get the right price points for, for drivers. We've worked with a group that started out of Montreal but is now expanding across uh, the continent, Lualek, uh, which we've been so proud to work with, uh, Outzu, uh, if you haven't heard of them, they started here in Toronto, I think I'm getting that right, Lily, and uh, are now expanding not only uh, to other cities in Canada but internationally to the States. And KintoShare, who you may not have heard of, but uh, Toyota is, uh, owns KintoShare, uh, and they're a car sharing platform that we're so proud uh, to have recently made an announcement with to get, again, more EVs out to drivers at price points uh, that they can handle and at price points that are competitive with the ICE vehicles that they've been traditionally renting or leasing. That was drivers. Uber operates a two-sided marketplace for its mobility platform, so riders are the next part of the equation. And as you all know, sustainability is tricky to get somebody to pay more for. It's even trickier to get somebody to do in the first place. So what we think our job is, is to take that Uber magic that folks have known from our platform and make it simple. Unless a clean ride can be accessed at the push of a button, at a reasonable price point, people won't do it. So we have two main products in this category, Uber Green, which in Canada blends in the hybrid population. In Europe, Uber Green is mostly an EV-only product, but we offer it in 170 markets around the world. We also offer Comfort Electric, which we launched just a few years ago. This is a more premium EV. These are Tesla Model 3s. Uh, these are Polestars. These are uh, Cadillac Lyrics um, that you can access at the push of a button. This is particularly popular with our business-to-business -business customers. We also want to activate our consumer base in terms of what it means to take an EV. So we just rolled out a few months ago this rider emission saving feature where you can see, all right, I took the Uber Green, I took the Comfort Electric. What did it mean since I didn't take the Uber X? How many emissions did I save? And we tally this up so over time riders can gamify this in the same way that they've found their ratings are a game. Uh, often, and you can do it after this, this talk, you can ask the person next to you, what's your Uber rating? Next year, you'll be asking them, how many emissions have you saved on Uber? That's the type of behavior we want to see happen because it gets especially younger consumers excited about pushing the green option. More and more, we're starting to work with airports. Airport travel is big on Uber. It's big with our business customers. We're finding win-win opportunities to work with airports that have ground-side emissions reductions plans where we can say, okay, can we find a preferred curb 
that works for customers and works for you, the airport, can we get a deal or a lower fee on pickup drop off and we'll only bring EVs to that curb. This is a great option, we think, not only for airports, but large venues that we hope can be a growing business opportunity for us and for the venues and hosts. I mentioned Uber for business. This is our B2B activity. Uber provides transportation services, ground transportation services, to companies around the world, banks, consultancies, anyone with a lot of employees that has ground travel or has historically rented cars or has historically taken uh, taxis. We provide Uber services. And now there's a U4B dashboard that you can see the emissions from all the trips that your employees take, as well as green options that we can service to your employees. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to do a workshop uh, with our current and prospective clients on the business side to talk about these offerings that we make available to business customers. Public side, I'm a policy guy. This part is really important to me. It's important to get right. And we think part of that is doing our job and our responsibility to be transparent about where we are today, where we're going tomorrow. If you go to uber.com and you go one more click through, we have a, a data transparency page where you can see how many EVs are present on Uber, how many drivers and rides have they provided, uh, and what are the emissions on an intensity basis. And we measure that as emissions per passenger mile or kilometer delivered, uh, and that's available on uber.com. We found in past studies working with outside partners that trips on Uber, all trips, EVs and non-EVs blended together, are about a third less than traditional on-demand services uh, over, over the years. So we're really proud of that. We want to shrink that, of course, to a zero figure for grams per passenger mile over time. We just worked with Bloomberg New Energy Finance earlier this year to release a report on what are the key policies that we just have to distill it to a few places where any government, whether uh, uh, say the province of British Columbia, which has a lot of progressive policies on EVs, to say someone just getting started, where would you begin if you wanted to accelerate electrification across the transport sector, and particularly for working and high mileage drivers, which rideshare would represent a portion of. We found four areas that are so critical, and hopefully these won't be a surprise to many of you in the room. Supply, policies which promote and cultivate active EV supply markets. The demand side of that, of course, which are incentives for consumers, and we think more and more as governments try to shrink those budgets, reasonably so as the EV markets start to pick up, to focus those budgets, remaining budgets on high mileage drivers, which is where you can get the benefit from an emissions basis and from a local economics basis. Third, of course, is charging. So critical to this are right to plug laws or right to charge laws, uh, as they can be called, but of course, investment. Investment in urban charging and investment in uh, charging for particularly those who don't have home charging options, so multi-unit housing options, curbside, and, and public overnight L2. The last piece, which is so critical, and something which really only cities can do, is leveraging existing uh, roadways and public space for vehicles to tilt the scale towards EVs. This is being done in cities like London, where they have a congestion charge on all vehicles, but have for the last 10 years to 15 years exempted EVs, meaning you don't have to pay the 12 and a half pound charge during congested hour if you're in an EV. If you're going in and out, that's a 25 pound charge in the city of London. So when you don't have to pay that, it's a huge economic signal to drivers to shift to EVs earlier than not. It's one of the reasons why we're now at a level of one in every five miles on Uber in London is in an EV. We promote policies like that around the world. It's not just congestion charges. It could be parking rates. It could be zones uh, with vehicles exclusions. It could be tolls. There's a whole host of opportunity there that cities can lean into to promote EVs. And it's difficult to understate their power. I've got just one or two more, and then we'll turn it over for questions. One of the final areas uh, which I'm so excited about, which is as a data-driven company, is asking the question, what can we do with all these data that we have? So we're developing a tool now where we can look at all the trips that happen on Uber, in EVs, in non-EVs, look at where drivers' home address locations are, look at the intensity of those miles and where the pickup drop-offs are happening and start to say, okay, if we can look at it, say, a month snapshot of activity, can we convert miles into kilowatt hours and plot that on a demand basis in space and time? So this tool uh, generates heat maps from our trips data on Uber and looks at peak kilowatt hour demand uh, per location. 
So this is looking at about the neighborhood or sub-neighborhood level. This example is showing Queens, New York, which is an area that uh, shaded uh, differently uh, is overrepresented by under uh, lower income communities, meaning it's eligible for more federal funding for EV charging. So we're starting to take this tool, share it with cities, share it with the utilities, share it with our charging partners so we can focus on what we call charging deserts in urban areas that are overrepresented by Uber drivers and Uber trips. We're really excited to roll this out so that we can try, again, try to chip away at the equity issue that has really plagued the EV industry traditionally. That's what I brought to share. I'm really curious about your questions, about your feedback on this. Let's do it this way, because I've got five minutes left. So what I'd love to do is take one or two questions, and then I'll try to do my best to then do a, a grouped answer. You were first, sir. So oh, and could you please share your name and affiliation? Sure. Uh, my name is Randy Terrell. I'm a self-employed consultant. Uh, TG Consulting is my company. Uh, so I have a question that's, I guess, a little outside your presentation, though relevant to what we're here for. So this is electric autonomy. Um, just curious what you guys think about uh, robo-taxis and autonomous uh, ride share. I know there's Chinese and U.S. cities that have robo-taxi uh, pilots up and running. So I don't know if you guys have it, something in the works or what you, how you see that, uh, that prospect. Thanks for that, Randy. Thanks. Okay, question about autonomous. I'll get to that question here. Yeah, sure. Hi, David Staniforth. I'm also a consultant. I work to help small fleets uh, transition to electrification. Great. And mine's more of a specific technical question, but uh, I'm just curious how you look at induction charging. Something could be very relevant for your drivers, and if that's something you've got any pilots going or uh, investing in. Thanks, David. Induction charging. Okay, autonomous question, induction charging question. Any other questions? You don't have to have it well thought through. You can just throw, throw out a couple of key words or something like that, nothing else. All right, who wants to hear the autonomous answer first or the induction answer first? You might be underwhelmed by both. Okay, I'm gonna start, we'll, we'll start in order. So thanks for that question, Randy. Uh, you know, Uber used to have an autonomous uh, hardware unit. In fact, uh, part of it was based here in Toronto out of UTI, uh, the, or sorry, University of Toronto, uh, because of the fantastic work that they do. We've since focused on the network side, so we aim to be the network of choice for autonomous fleets, which more and more are all electric fleets uh, from a number of brands out there. We have an autonomous group that thinks about that integration on the software side. So whether you're a human driver in an EV or an autonomous vehicle, that's an EV. We want to be the network of choice that you can plug into. And like I mentioned, uh, we want to help drivers and ultimately autonomous vehicles plug into our network, which can be multi-sided and absorb the cheapest electrons, then convert those to the most expensive miles. Perhaps one day we'll go in reverse in a, in a V to X world where you'd say take your miles and convert them back to electrons depending on the circumstances. So whether or not uh, that's the case, we want to be the platform of choice for those assets. Uh, it's not happening tomorrow, but as it happens over time, we'll want to be there. We're focused right now on human drivers and the shift to EVs, which has been a challenge, but we're making some progress. The question, thank you, David, uh, for uh, induction charging. The short answer is no. We have not focused on this. We don't have any charging partnerships on induction. Um, I think there's some really promising things out there, whether the vehicle's in motion or stationary. Um, there's a long way to go. When I started in the field 20 plus years ago, working for the California Air Resources Board, I remember those induction paddles uh, with GM. Now that that's in the roadway, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, keep me posted on the induction pro progress, and I'm sure we wouldn't turn down a fantastic opportunity if it, again, made sense for the driver. I mentioned earlier what drivers care about is what we call the opportunity cost of charging. So not only is it that range anxiety in the car, oh my God, am I gonna run out of charge with a paying customer in the back, but if you're a rideshare driver or a taxi fleet or any uh, professional services driver, uptime is everything. So you're not just worried about where can I charge and when am I gonna run out of charge, you're thinking about how much revenue earning hours can I have my vehicle out there for or your autonomous fleet for. So when drivers think about that, the it's a number of things, not just the plug-in time, that's probably the sweetest time. You could take a break when the car's charging. It's the, the, the availability of those chargers. It is the time to travel to those chargers. It's the search cost initially. We're like, shit, I've got to find charging and trying to figure out which app do I use to find it. So we think we have opportunities to cut down that time all the way. 
induction could be a solution somewhere at the end of that pipeline to, again, re reduce a driver's co opportunity cost of charging, which is a real cost. We, we've calculated it somewhere between 10 and 20% to drivers versus, say, an ICE counterpart in a Prius, which you know, can get 600 miles in its tank in five minutes at any corner petrol station. That's tough competition. And the Prius is only getting better. So we have work to do. Any solutions that you can bring on the hardware or software side, we'd be interested to hear. Any other questions? There's 15 seconds. If you can get it in in five seconds, I can answer it in five. More comment related. Uh, I've been an Uber driver green for over seven years. Uh, love it. You guys do a great job. What's your name? L Larry Trackalo. Now I'm actually representing a solar electric vehicle out of California called the Aptera. Um, and that is a place that I actually want to talk to you and see if there's an open opportunity because it's only driver and one person. So it's great for Eats or if there was a in the app of one person travel because probably 40 to 50 percent of the rides are only one person. Amazing, Larry. Well, could, can we just finish with a round of applause for Larry driving EVs on Uber? Thank you so much, Larry. I couldn't have found a better way to end this, so thank you for that. Let's talk after. I'll meet you in the back there. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and look forward to chatting more later. Thank you.